Good morning. Good morning. Uh, welcome to uh, Angelica. Good, it works. <laughs> uh, good morning. Um, uh, I'm Alfonso Caramazza. Uh, uh, welcome to this, the 12th, uh, 12th, 12th, is it right? Um, 12th uh, edition of CAOS. Uh, CAOS uh, stands for Concepts, Actions, and Objects. And, uh, and the reason we came up with this name was because we, we, are sh we were sure then, and I think uh, it's been confirmed uh, by s subsequent um, editions of meeting that the discussion would be chaotic. Uh, and that's because the underlying uh, theories uh, of, of action concepts and uh, objects uh, are in fact quite chaotic. And um, that's, that's not bad. I mean, that uh, perhaps makes more work for us, uh, trying, to, um, trying to advance understanding of these uh, aspects of mind-brain. Um, and one of the nice features uh, of the workshop, as you know, is that uh, the talks uh, are only 45 minutes long, and we uh, reserve 30 minutes uh, for discussion. And that's a fairly uh, religiously observed part of the workshop, so we ask speakers to please stay to the time they've been, that they've been allocated so that we can have a full discussion uh, that doesn't just look at, uh, at the numbers that they presented on the, on the, in the slides, uh, but the background assumptions that led them to think that those numbers might be interesting. Um, so, so that perhaps where the chaotic element comes in because people have profoundly differing views about, about these theories of mind and brain, and they of course also have uh, profoundly different views about the relevance of observations that they think might be relevant to addressing the questions that they're interested in. So, we especially encourage the younger people to participate. Uh, there is a, a rather unfortunate uh, pattern that we have tried to correct. Uh, the, the older, less flexible people sit in the front. And being inflexible, they also have a hard time remaining silent. Uh, and the younger people sit in the back, and they don't ask questions. So please, let's mix it up change your seats and sort of move forward, not right now, but during the, 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 the workshop, uh, and, and please participate. Uh, your questions will not be any less interesting than the questions that all the people uh, uh, would, be, would ask. So please participate. The workshop is done primarily for, for you, and so we hope to take full advantage of it. Uh, we are really uh, grateful to the speakers. This year there's been a change. We've reduced the length of the workshop because we used to have a, a Sunday morning session and that sort of was never really successful because people tended to leave Sunday morning and so we were left with two speakers. We had to sit up here and talk to a smaller audience. That's changed. We now have the social event uh, Saturday evening, the last thing we do, so we hope you all stay through Saturday evening uh, and then Sunday uh, you're off. So we're grateful to the speakers and uh, um, I'm going to share the first session and uh, today um, and it's my great pleasure to introduce the, the first speaker, Michael McCloskey, uh, who's going to give a talk uh, entitled Handwriting and the Grammar of Action. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Mike because uh, Mike and I uh, were colleagues at Johns Hopkins, uh, I don't know, let me see, 15 years, 15 years, something like that. Um, and uh, Mike had, had the good sense, I, I, I've, I've always been an admirer of Mike's work, he's sort of one of the most uh, uh, analytic uh, thinkers, um, deep thinkers. Um, uh, and Mike had, uh, initially showed sort of really poor taste when I first met him, the first time I met him. And, and he wanted to come and do a PhD with me. 
And I told him, you're crazy. <laughs> uh, you should go work somewhere else. He went to Princeton to work with Sam Glucksberg. I uh, showed real good taste at that point, uh, but then it showed again bad taste when he came back to Hopkins. Uh, and we started working together on a number of projects. Uh, I tried to convince him uh, that chairs uh, have certain kinds of uh, inherent features, um, and we were struggling with all of the discussions at the time uh, between uh, uh, indeterminate sort of or, or, or concepts that uh, don't have necessarily sufficient features, whether they do, whether the concepts are vague or fuzzy or uh, or whatever, and, and we spent a lot of time talking about these things at lunch, and when we first uh, Mike came, we used to go to lunch, a small group of us, Howard Egeth, Bob Cargon, and others uh, uh, at the faculty club, and we noticed that uh, after about uh, seven months or something like that, that the colleagues kept on finding excuses for not coming to lunch. And, uh, and so eventually it was just Mike and me left there to argue about exactly what what one understands when one says they don't know what a chair is. And at that point we realized that perhaps we had done enough talking about these things, they should do the science rather than the discussion. Anyways, Mike is, uh, is, uh, is the first speaker, um, and uh, please welcome him for the, the first speaker of the session, Mike. Thank you, Alfonso. Thanks to the organizers for the invitation. And I just want to say that you know, any, any errors in reasoning or interpretation are, are due to Alfonso's influence during my formative years. Um, so writing is what I'm going to talk about today. And I think it's an especially interesting cognitive function because it takes us all the way from thought to action. And suppose, for example, that you want to write the word cat. So you start with some meaning or idea in mind, and through some interesting processes that I won't talk about, you need to activate how that word is spelled as a series of abstract letter representations, C, A, and T. Now this, though, doesn't tell you how to write the word because you need to know how to form the letters. So in order to do that, you need to retrieve from memory some learned motor patterns that you acquired as a result of learning to write. So if you're going to write the word in lowercase, those patterns might look a little bit like this, describing how the strokes are made, whereas if you're writing in uppercase, they might look more like this. These motor patterns are seem to be effector independent in the sense that they can drive writing with your preferred hand or your non-preferred hand or your foot or your nose or whatever it might be. So in order to actually write with a particular hand, say, you need to generate or you need to convert these into effector-specific motor programs. And then through the, the magic of the motor system, you ultimately produce the written response. Now, in my talk today, I'm going to focus mostly on the level of these abstract, um, effector-independent graphic motor plans which in some real sense, I think, are the interface between thought and action in this domain. So I'm going to talk about three topics, handwriting and the grammar of action, which I'll spend most of the time on, uh, when graphic motor plans go bad, uh, a little bit less time on, and then very briefly, writing and letter-shaped knowledge. So let's get right in there. My collaborator on this first part is Dolly Ellenblum, a graduate student working with me. And the question we're looking at here has to do with the stroke patterns that we use in writing letters. So we know that each form of a character has a particular shape, like the uppercase print A looks like this. But this shape could be realized in writing in various different ways, with various different sequences of writing strokes. So here I've written A in three different ways. In the first case, 
I started at the top and drew downward and then picked up the pen and came back to the top. Drew the next stroke downward, picked up the pen again, and drew the horizontal stroke in the final uh, part of it. The second example, and this is the stroke pattern now. The second example is exactly the same except I didn't pick up the pen after the first stroke. In the third case, though, I started at the bottom and then proceeded like this. And so these are all reasonable stroke patterns for drawing an A. When I'm talking about these stroke patterns, just to introduce a tiny bit of terminology, I'm going to use the term base strokes to refer to the strokes that make up the character shape itself. So in the first example, 1, 3, and 5 are the base strokes. And I'll call the strokes that are made either with the pen up or the pen down to get from the end of one stroke to the start of another when necessary. I'll call those the transition strokes. So 2 and 4 are transition strokes in both of the first two examples. Now I've said that there can be variation in how you write a letter, as in this example with A, but that doesn't mean that any possible stroke pattern is equally good or equally likely. Most of the potential ways of writing a letter you will never observe. So we're very unlikely to see anybody write an A like this. If you do, please let me know afterwards. <laughs> the question is, why do we use certain stroke patterns and not others when we write letters? And here I think the concept of a grammar of action may be useful. Uh, in Lashley's classic paper on serial order back in 1951, he argued that actions are governed by systems of rules that are analogous to the grammatical rule systems that govern language. And in fact, he used the term syntax of actions. A bit later, Goodnow and Levine were studying copying uh, in children, and they used the term grammar of action for this, describing it in, by saying that the paths that children follow when copying can be described in terms of a limited set of principles or rules that specify where to start and how to proceed. And another important piece of work in this tradition was a really lovely book by Van Summers published in 1984 in which he described a number of rules and regularities observed in individuals drawing simple and complex shapes. Now, this grammar of action concept, though, was never fully developed. In the studies of drawing and copying, some rules were proposed that are supposedly governed the performance, such as start at the top or don't lift the pen. And it's clear that these rules do capture some regularities in drawing and copying performance, but they don't provide a full and systematic account of how the shapes are produced. So the goal in the work I'm going to talk about today is to try to develop a more formal computational framework for applying this grammar of action concept to the writing of characters. And this is something that hasn't really been done before. I do want to acknowledge some really interesting work by Lake and colleagues uh, in a Bayesian framework, but their goals are a little bit different in most respects from what I'm going to talk about. So the approach that we've taken is try to try to develop this framework within the context of optimality theory, which is a theoretical framework proposed in linguistics by Prince and Smolensky, and especially in phonology, but it's also been applied in other aspects of linguistics. OT has several properties that I think are useful for us. First, there are rules or constraints, as they're called in OT, but they're viable. They're soft constraints instead of hard constraints. Second, there's an assumption that constraints are ranked in importance, such that some are more crucial than others. And the optimal form of something, in this case, the optimal way of writing a character, is determined by which constraints are violated and how highly they're ranked. So let me try to give you a really simplified example to show how we can apply this framework to writing. Let's suppose to go back to the capital A that we have two possible ways of writing it, which I'll call candidates one and two. The first way is where we start at the top and come down, and the second way is where we start at the bottom and go up. And then suppose we have two rules or constraints, one that says you should start at the top and the other that says that you shouldn't lift the pen. Now we can evaluate each of the candidates according to these constraints by counting up how many times each of them violates the constraints. 
So the first candidate, candidate one, it does start at the top. So there are no violations of that constraint. However, there are two places where the pen is lifted, after the first stroke and after the third. And so there are two violations of the constraint that says you shouldn't lift the pen. Candidate two, on the other hand, starts at the bottom. So it violates the constraint that you should start at the top. However, it only involves one lift of the pen. So which candidate should we prefer? Well, that depends on how we rank the constraints. If start at the top dominates is considered more important than no pen lifts, then candidate one is going to be optimal because it does start at the top. We're willing to tolerate the extra lift of the pen in order to satisfy the more important constraint of starting at the top. On the other hand, if we consider no pen lifts to be more important than starting at the top, then candidate two is optimal because it minimizes the lifts of the pen. And this illustrates one uh, principle in optimality theory called strict domination, which is that one violation of a high rank constraint is worse than any number of violations of lower rank constraints. Okay. Now this example is useful for laying out some of the ideas in optimality theory, but it doesn't fully capture what we're going to be doing when we're modeling the writing of characters. First, we're going to be dealing with whole character sets and not just a single character. But second, uh, in this example, I started with uh, some ranking of the constraints and then used that to decide which pattern was most optimal. But in the modeling, what we're going to be doing is saying, given a set of observations about the actual stroke patterns, can we find a set of constraints and a ranking of them that would account for that uh, set of stroke patterns? So in the modeling, I'll describe we're going to be looking at several things. First, we're going to be looking at prescribed stroke patterns, the way people are taught to write. So the way my teacher taught me to write an A is what I described as candidate one and is shown here. But it's also the case that people don't always write the way they were taught. In fact, they almost never do. So we're going to also look at the actual stroke patterns, how people do in practice write their letters. And we're going to look at different writing systems, in this case, English and Hebrew, in the work we've done so far. So let me try to show you how the whole process works with the prescribed stroke patterns in English. So here we're going to be attempting to account for how people are taught to write the Roman letters, the upper and lowercase letters, uh, when they're writing English. We first start by describing or representing each character shape as a set of base strokes. So for the capital A, there are clearly three separate strokes, the two diagonals and the horizontal stroke. And then we generate all the possible stroke patterns for each of the characters. And specifically, what we did is take all combinations of the possible directions for each base stroke. So for the A, for example, this first stroke could be written downward or it could be written upward the possible orderings of the three strokes, the sequence they're written in, for example, one, two, three here, or a different ordering, which I lost somewhere here, but anyway. And whether the pen is up or down on each transition stroke. So for example, if a stroke pattern involves drawing this base stroke down with first, the stroke that comes back to the top, the transition, could be made either with the pen down or the pen up. And so if we do this for the letter A, we end up with 176 different ways you could write A. And taking all the upper and lowercase letters, all 52, used in English, there are nearly 13,000 candidates. All right, we also need a set of rules or constraints. And so for the modeling, we initially generated 25 constraints that are based on considerations like naturalness or precision of motion. Some motions are better controlled or more natural than others. How efficient the production process is going to be and how legible the outcome will be. And these constraints primarily have to do with things like the direction of the individual strokes. So for example, one of them says that horizontal movements in writing strokes should go from left to right. This is based on 
the idea that, at least for right-handers, uh, horizontal motions from left to right are better controlled than motions from right to left. Vertical stroke direction up to down, similarly based on notions of, of motor control. Some other constraints had to do with how we order the strokes. So in, in letters that have multiple strokes, which one do you do first, which one do you do second, and so forth. And so one of the constraints here says that the horizontal order of the strokes should generally go from left to right. This is an efficiency consideration given that in English, the writing on the line moves from left to right. It makes most sense, usually other things being equal, to start where the previous letter left off and to end where the next one is going to start. And other constraints have to do with faithfulness to the character shape. Uh, obviously, to be legible, you want it to look like it's supposed to look when you write it. So uh, one such constraint is to keep the pen up when you're making a transition stroke. All right, so given that we have candidates and constraints, then we can tally up all the constraint violations. <laughs> so in the simple example I gave you, there were two candidates and two constraints. But we actually do this for all 13,000 candidates and all 25 constraints, so we have a large matrix of constraint violations. <coughs> then we also need to know what the target stroke patterns are, meaning what candidate we want to be chosen as optimal, because this is what we're going to be trying to account for. And so for prescribed writing, these are the stroke patterns taught in school, these ones I've shown you before. So these are the ones we want the modeling to pick out as optimal. Once we've done all that, then we can see if we can do the constraint ranking. So given that we have all these candidates with their constraint violations tallied, and we have a target candidate, the one that should be optimal for each character, the question is, can we find a ranking of our constraints that will select the target candidate as the optimal one for all the characters? In other words, we want the same ranking of constraints to pick out all of these particular patterns. And to see whether this is, can be done, we apply some constraint ranking algorithms that I'm not going to talk about. So what happens? Well, with the English prescribed stroke patterns, we are successful. It turns out that we can capture these patterns with a set of rank viable constraints. It turns out that we need 11 constraints to select the 52 targets from the 13,000 candidates. The other constraints are ranked lower by the ranking algorithms, and they don't, in fact, do any work at all in picking out the targets. So this is the set of ranked constraints that we uh, ended up needing. I'm not going to, to talk about these in any detail, except to say that this ranking tends to emphasize well-controlled movements and legibility at the expense of speed. And this makes sense for patterns that are taught to children where the emphasis is on, on legibility. OK, so given that we can do this for English prescribed patterns, we can ask, well, will this also be successful in other writing systems or just maybe only in English? So we also decided to hmm? Uh, sorry, these are, these are the prescribed patterns. These are what people are taught to write. And so right-handers and left-handers are taught the same thing. I will be talking about some writing by left-handers a little bit later because it raises very interesting questions, I'm sure, for reasons that you're, you're thinking about. Yeah, okay. So we want to do the same thing with Hebrew here, again, looking at the prescribed stroke patterns. And these are going to be taught the same way regardless of, of what hand you write with. Whether they should or not is another question. Hebrew is interesting because it's a right-to-left writing system, as you know. And just to tell you a little bit more in case you're not extremely familiar with it, there are two distinct forms of writing. There's what I'll call print, which is used in printed material. The characters look something like this when they're printed. Children are taught to write these characters, uh, in which case they look more like this when they're actually written. But they, they rarely, if ever, write them as adults. There's another form of writing, which I'll call script, which is used for handwriting. And the characters look something like this. Um, even though I'm calling it script, it's not a cursive writing style. The characters are not connected. They're still, they're still separated. OK, so we did the same sort of modeling with Hebrew, although we did introduce some new constraints uh, having to do with right to left instead of left to right. Uh, movements. And again, we found that we could successfully account for the stroke patterns 
with a set of ranked constraints. For print, we again need 11 constraints, although they're not exactly the same as for English. For script, we could account for the patterns with only seven constraints. There are a lot of interesting contrasts between the print and the script and between English and Hebrew. I'm just going to pick out one example to show you having to do with the, with the two languages. So, as you know, English is a left to right writing system. And so in modeling English, we needed constraints reflecting this fact having to do with both stroke direction, in other words, the direction in which you move the pen when you are writing, and stroke ordering, the sequencing of strokes uh, one to the other. So we needed a constraint that said make your horizontal strokes from left to right, and we needed another constraint that says order your strokes from, from left to right. Hebrew being a right to left writing system, uh, the perhaps default assumption is that everything will work in the opposite direction. So that you should make your strokes from right to left, other things being equal, and you should order the strokes from right to left also, so that you have the movement in the appropriate direction across the line. However, it's been suggested by Van Summers, as opposed, in addition to a few other people, that in fact, even though writing across the line goes from right to left, the individual characters are still written from left to right on the basis of motor control considerations. And so if we adopt that hypothesis, we might expect to find we need exactly the same constraints as in English, with stroke direction preferred left to right and stroke ordering preferred to be left to right. What we actually find is quite interesting, which is a combination of the two. What we needed to model the Hebrew stroke patterns is a constraint that says the direction of writing strokes should go from left to right, but the ordering of strokes should go from right to left. And this makes a certain amount of sense if you think about it, because the direction you move the pen while you're writing is determined at least in part, or is motivated at least in part, by issues of motor control. That if you're right-handed, you have better control of the pen from left to right than right to left. Stroke ordering, though, is more a matter of efficiency of wanting to start where the previous character left off and end where the next character is going to start. And so you get this kind of interesting contrast between the individual stroke direction and the ordering of strokes. Now, one question that could come up here is, well, do we need modeling to tell us this? Why can't we just look at the stroke patterns themselves and answer this question? The reason I think is that, except for the very highest rank constraints, these constraints can all be violated. Remember, they're soft constraints, and they typically are violated in at least some characters, so that the underlying constraints may not always be apparent in the surface performance. So let me just show you this for two characters, Bet and Ein. If you look at the first one, the one on the left, bet, you can see that the two horizontal strokes do indeed go from left to right, as those constraints would suggest, the stroke direction constraint would suggest. However, if we look at the other character, the horizontal stroke goes from right to left. So just looking at these and other characters, it's not obvious what the stroke direction constraint might be. The reason that the stroke goes from right to left in the character on the right is that there is a higher rank constraint that dictates that that should be the stroke pattern, having to do with not lifting the pen, essentially. So what I want to suggest is that the modeling can reveal constraints and relationships among constraints that may not be obvious from simple inspection of the stroke patterns. OK, so, so far I've been talking about how people are taught to write, and it seems there is systematicity in the stroke patterns, which is nice. But what about actual writing? People don't, as I said, always write the way they were taught. So what we've tried to do is look at actual writing uh, in both English and Hebrew, with print and script in Hebrew and upper and lower case in English in a number of experiments. So the way these experiments are conducted is that the participants are writing words to dictation or individual letters uh, using a special ballpoint pen, writing on paper, so it's a very natural way to write. But the paper is on a graphics tablet so that we can record moment by moment the pen position. And the tablet allows us to track the position of the pen not only when it's in contact with the paper, but also when it's lifted. So we can look at the movements 
of the pen when it's not on the paper. And so we can then display the performance uh, any way we want to. So this is an example of somebody obviously writing the word frozen. And I'll show you a couple of other examples like this just to, to orient you. I've chosen to display the stroke so the beginning of the stroke is in red and progresses to blue at the end. That way you can tell the stroke direction. And the transitions with the pen up are in gray. Okay. All right, so as I said, we've conducted a number of experiments. I'm just going to pick out two phenomena to tell you about. One of them has to do with Hebrew script, and here we're just uh, modeling the performance as before. This is an example of some Hebrew script writing. We tested 24 native Hebrew speakers, and we modeled each participant separately. So because different people may write in different ways, and the goal was to see if we could use the same constraints for everyone, but account for differences between individuals and differences from prescribed writing in terms of the ranking of the constraints. And so for each participant, the target stroke patterns were the patterns that that participant actually produced. So when we did this, I think we had good success. We were completely successful for two-thirds of the participants. Uh, is that two-thirds? Three-fourths? A lot of them. As Alfonso said, it's more than just the numbers. Uh, and for the others, we're mostly successful, meaning that we could account for everything but perhaps one or two characters. And when we look at what we see here, when we compare the prescribed and the actual writing and the differences among individuals, the constraint rankings tend to reflect speed legibility trade-offs. So as you can imagine, the faster you write, up perhaps the less legible you are, and the ranking of the constraints among different individuals reflect different points on that speed legibility trade-off. Just to give you one example, I'll show you a little bit of writing by a participant, DCR. So here are two Hebrew script characters uh, that are similar. And in the prescribed stroke patterns, shown here, the first stroke should start at the top and be drawn down, and then the pen lifted, and then the second stroke drawn. And so here's an example of a different participant who did, in fact, write these in the prescribed way. So the strokes come down initially. DCR, on the other hand, wrote these differently, starting at the bottom and making the initial stroke up and not lifting the pen at all. The prescribed pattern, in order to model that in the context of all the other characters, we need, among other constraints, one that says the stroke direction, the vertical stroke direction, should be starting at the top and coming downward. And second, that the pen should not be lifted. But the stroke direction constraint has to be ranked above the pen lift. So in the prescribed pattern, uh, the pen lift is tolerated in order to uh, conform to the up to down constraint for the stroke direction. For DCR, however, we still need these two constraints, but the ordering needs to be different. Now, no pen lifts is ranked above the stroke direction. So DCR, in DCR's writing, the non-preferred stroke direction is tolerated to avoid lifting the pen. Now, you might think that DCR just doesn't care about the stroke direction, the vertical stroke direction, or maybe DCR even prefers to make strokes up to down. But in fact, that's not the case. If we look at other characters where using a non-preferred stroke direction would not save any pen lifts, uh, DCR writes in the preferred way. So for these two characters, the strokes are actually made uh, up to down. So this ranking of constraint will in fact account for all of DCI, DCR's writing and not just those two that I told you. So again, that we seem to capture some of the regularities in the writing by varying the constraints uh, for the different individuals. OK, so I now want to talk about another phenomenon with the actual writing. This gets to Alex's question about left versus right hand. And we've carried out an experiment in which we asked left and right handers to write English words. So in prescribed writing, as we've already seen, 
we need the constraint that says stroke direction horizontally should be from left to right. And I've suggested that this is due at least in part to the fact that you have better motor control for left to right than right to left strokes. But this is true only for right-handers. It's in fact the opposite for left-handers, uh, in which case the left to right, right to left movements are better controlled. So this leads to a prediction that we can make about what we should see in actual writing. So for right-handers, when they're writing, they should do just the same thing as is in the prescribed uh, stroke patterns. Or more specifically, we should need a constraint that says the preferred stroke direction is from left to right. However, for left-handers, we predicted that we would at least see some tendency toward a shift where we would need a constraint that says the preferred direction of the writing stroke should be from right to left. And this was, in fact, what we saw in the model. Let me give you a, a, an example of where this plays out particularly clearly. If we look at the horizontal stroke for the lowercase f. So when we have right-handers writing this, I'll give you, this is a little clip of a right-hander, and you can see that in that case, as one might expect, the horizontal stroke was drawn from left to right. However, here is a left-handed participant, and you can see that participant drew it from right to left, even though that means the end of the letter was way over to the left, meaning a large pen movement was needed to get to the start of the next, uh, of the next letter. If we add up the numbers, if we look at right-handers, all 20 of our participants wrote those strokes from left to right, whereas the left-handers 17 out of 20 wrote them from right to left. And we actually did a little bit more in this experiment. We had uh, right and left handers write both with their preferred and their non-preferred hand. And so I just copied the results uh, that I showed you before with the preferred hand. Now let's look at what happens with the non-preferred hand. When the right handers are writing with their left hands, two-thirds of them shift to making the strokes from right to left. Yeah. Okay. And for the left-handers, uh, 17 out of 20, when they're writing with their right hand, do just what right-handers do when they're writing. So it's not about whether you're right or left-handed. It's about which hand you are writing with, as one would expect based on notions of motor control. These results, I think, raise some really interesting questions about the nature of the learned graphic motor plans, how the movements are represented. Uh, but we can talk about that in discussion if anybody wants to. All right. So to conclude this part, I'd want to argue that stroke patterns in writing can be modeled with a formal rule system or grammar of action. And the modeling is useful for articulating principles that underlie the writing and also understanding how they interact with one another. And optimality theory is promising because of these uh, properties that I've talked to you about before. So there are a lot of next steps and continuing work here. This is very early stages, both empirical things we want to do and difficult theoretical questions. Uh, let me just highlight one of them. I think that this perspective may be very useful in looking at the development of writing ability. So here is, here's my daughter, Aria, uh, illustrating the importance of good posture in writing. And this is from a couple of years ago. And this is an example of her writing. Now, there are a lot of things going on here, but I want to call your attention to just two of them. Here she's reversed the capital J, and here she's reversed the Y, both very characteristic of her writing at this time. Now, you might just say, well, yeah, kids reverse letters from left to right. But in fact, it's not true that they reverse all the letters. There are systematicities into which letters are or are not reversed. And one of the considerations that determines whether this happens or not may have to do with how well the correct versus reverse patterns conform to the writing constraint. This reverse J is actually better in conformity with the constraints that govern English writing than the correct J because the stroke moves from left to right instead of right to left. And similar, uh, similar considerations apply to the Y. So if we look at the errors children make or the letters they have difficulty with from this perspective, we may gain some insights we might not otherwise have had. OK. All right, let me move on now to the second part uh, when graphic motor plans 
plans go bad, my collaborators here, Teresa Schubert and Carolyn Ryack. I'm going to talk to you about a, an individual, MGN, who suffered a stroke in, in 2013, uh, leading to, to substantial uh, left posterior uh, ventral damage. And so MGN showed impaired writing to dictation. When we ask for right words, we say black to him, he'll write and make errors. And so we had him write a very large number of words on the graphics tablet. And these are characteristic examples of his errors. He tended to substitute incorrect letters for some of the correct letters. So here he's written an R instead of the B, and in the second example a K instead of a Y. Now, if we try to characterize where his errors are coming about, the first thing you might think about, well, is he has a spelling deficit, so he doesn't know how to spell these words. This, in fact, is not true. He is perfectly able to spell these words aloud, so he would say B-L-A-C-K for black, even when he's writing an R as the first letter. Uh, also, this is not anything like a peripheral motor deficit. There are many reasons for this conclusion, among others, that he can copy letters without any difficulty whatsoever. So the results suggest that he has some sort of impairment in activating the graphic motor plane. And what I want to look at here is what's the nature of this impairment and what implications might it have for our understanding of writing. So as I've said, his writing errors are mostly letter substitutions, as in this example I already showed you. For this sort of deficit, where it's not a spelling but a writing problem, the default interpretation is that the wrong graphic motor plan gets activated, the graphic motor plan for the wrong letter. So that here he would correctly activate the abstract letter identity Y, but then something would go wrong and he might retrieve the graphic motor plan for the letter K instead. And then the writing of the letter would proceed normally thereafter, so he would produce a K. And this is what I initially assumed was going on. However, the more I looked at his results, the more I became unsatisfied with this. Because if we look carefully at his performance, it's clear that correct and erroneous letters are produced differently. And let me just make clear what we're talking about here. Here's an example for the letter K, where on the left, this is a correct K. In other words, it's a K that was produced when the target letter was K. And on the right is an incorrect K, the K produced per year, where the target letter was a Y. Various properties of the production differ between these correct and incorrect k's. So, for example, if we look at the time it takes to write, and the, the result I'll show you is across all the letters, not just for k's, correct letters on average take about 700 milliseconds to write. Incorrect letters, though, it took him on average twice as long. And this result holds for each of the individual letters of the alphabet. So clearly it's taking him longer to write the erroneous letters. <laughs> And this is not necessarily what you would expect if just the wrong graphic motor plane gets retrieved and then once it starts, it's written normally. Because the, the number I, I was giving you there was from the time the pen starts to write the letter until it finishes. In addition, the erroneous letters tend to show atypical stroke patterns. So again, let's look at K. Now I'm just going to look at K specifically across the many tens of thousands of letters we had uh, in GN write, we observed two stroke patterns for the letter K. In this first pattern, he writes the vertical stroke downward, then goes to the upper right and comes down, and then writes the third stroke downward like that. The other pattern, again, has the first stroke vertically, but then he comes to the middle of that vertical stroke and goes upward for the second stroke and then downward for the third. Now both of these are reasonable ways to write K, but what's interesting is there's a very distri different distribution of these two for correct K's and incorrect K's. So of the nearly 600 correct K's, 557 of them are written with the first stroke pattern. In other words, 98% of them. However, for the erroneous case, it's reversed so that 80% are written with the second stroke pattern. This again is not obviously accounted for if you're just assuming that something went wrong earlier in the process and the graphic motor plan for K 
got activated in the case of the errors. There's no reason to expect the stroke patterns to differ. So this raises the possibility that his errors don't result from activating the wrong uh, graphic motor plane. And so then the question is, well, what could be happening instead? So I want to look at a couple of the performances in a little bit more detail. A little bit cut off at the top. This is an example of a correct R. And what I've shown here is a graph of the pin velocity over time while that letter is being written. So the black curves here are when the pen was writing, and the gray is when the pen was lifted between strokes. So I'm dividing it into strokes here. This first uh, peak is for the vertical stroke. It's very typical that when you start the stroke, your velocity is slow. It increases to around the middle, and then slows down again as you come to the end. Uh, that's the transition in gray. Then the loop here is the double uh, humped curve there, which is perfectly typical, and then the, uh, then the diagonal stroke. And this is all very nice and smooth and fast. The total performance takes about 800 milliseconds. I've just color-coded these so you can just see about how long each one is taking. Uh, the colors have the only, the only the function of distinguishing the different strokes, the gray for the transition. All right, now here what I've done, this is the same thing, except I've moved it over to the left and I've extended the time out to about six seconds because we're going to need that to look at a different re response. And now the, the performance is crunched over onto the left. This is an erroneous R. This is an R NGN wrote when the correct letter was a B. And this is what the uh, velocity function looks like. One thing you can immediately see is it took him a lot longer. It took him about four seconds to write this letter. But what's also interesting is that it was not just uniformly slow. Rather, the vertical stroke and the loop are drawn quickly and fluently. But it appears that something went wrong right about here. And after that, he's writing very slowly and hesitantly. And interestingly, this is exactly where the uh, erroneous letter, the R, diverges from the correct letter, B. Okay. One more example. This, this is the same one over here I just moved over. And now here's an R he was writing when the correct letter was a D. This one takes him even longer, about six seconds to write. Uh, but again, it's not slow the entire time. In this case, the initial vertical stroke is perfectly fast and fluent. But then as he's bringing the pen back up, something goes wrong right about there, uh, right before he's supposed to start writing the loop. And then after that, the loop is very slow uh, and hesitant. And then eventually, I guess, he decides what he's going to do. He writes the diagonal stroke fairly quickly. Interestingly, again, it looks like something goes wrong about at the point where the correct letter diverges from the incorrect letter. Okay, so I'm a little bit behind. All right, so the letters are not uniformly slow. The difficulty seems to occur at particular points, and usually at or near the stroke boundaries, and usually at or before the point where the correct or incorrect letters diverge. So what this suggests is that maybe what's happening here is that he's usually retrieving the correct motor plan. When he's trying to write a B, he retrieves the plan for B. But sometimes it's not fully activated. Maybe there are strokes missing, or maybe there's some information about strokes that are missing. And as a result, at some point, he reaches an impasse. He doesn't have the information he needs to proceed. And things come to a slowdown or perhaps a grinding halt. And he then may attempt to complete the letter uh, to make it into some real letter. And it looks, in fact, like this is what he's doing. At some points, it seems fairly obvious. So here he's been trying to write an F. He writes the vertical stroke and the first horizontal stroke. And then something apparently goes wrong. And it looks like maybe he's saying, well, I guess I could make this into a P. And here's another example where he's trying to write an R and ends up converting it into a G. So I think that understanding the dysfunction here as retrieving the right motor plane of something going wrong 
is interesting in its own right, but it also has implications for how we're going to use these data to make inferences about normal writing. So if the deficit involves retrieving the wrong motor plan, then the errors are telling us about the processes that determine which motor plan gets retrieved. On the other hand, if the deficit involves incomplete activation of the correct motor plan, then the errors may shed light on the structure of the motor plans themselves, telling us, for example, that the strokes, individual strokes, are units in the representation, perhaps telling us where the stroke boundaries are, and perhaps telling us that we should think about these stroke representations as collections of parameters, such that some parameters can be present and others can be, can be missing. So just briefly, this may lead us to reinterpret some of the errors that we see. So here, for example, he's written a D instead of a P. Well, this could be retrieving the D motor plan, but on the other hand, a possibility is that maybe what happened is that for the second stroke, he had information that it was supposed to be a loop, but not information about where it was supposed to end. And so this could be a stroke endpoint error. Here, this is an attempt to write a T where he first writes the horizontal line and then should place the vertical line in the middle, but misplaces it, perhaps because he doesn't have the necessary information about where that stroke should go. And then it looks like he's just tried to make this into something else, perhaps not very successfully. So that may be a stroke location error. All right, so what I would want to argue here is that fine grain analysis of the writing deficits can shed light on the nature of these graphic motor plans and how they work and how they malfunction. And more generally, that really thinking carefully about how to characterize the deficits is crucial in cognitive neuropsychological research. Now, I know that I don't have much time, but this is very brief, and if you will indulge me. So this is writing a letter-shaped knowledge, and my collaborators here are Kim Wong and Dolly Ellenbloom. And this, this part is subtitled, How We Became Instant Internet Celebrities. So we recently stumbled on a phenomenon suggesting that unless we learn to write a letter, our knowledge of that letter shape may be surprisingly poor. And this phenomenon has to do with the letter G. And the knowledge we end up with when we don't write a letter may be poor, even if we have massive exposure to that letter. So in print and electronic media, there are two distinct forms of lowercase g. The open tail g, which is shown here, and what's called the loop tail g, which I'm not going to show you right yet. The loop tail g is by far the more common. You all have millions of exposures to it. But we don't learn to write it. And we carried out a number of experiments and suggesting that skilled reader's knowledge of this letter shape is really not very good. So one of these experiments is very simple. You just show in four possible forms of this and ask to say which is the correct one. Okay, so you can take a moment and, and decide. Uh, it turns out that this is the correct answer here. Okay, uh, I won't ask you whether you're right or not. When we asked a number of people to do this, only 28% chose the correct answer. And as, of course, with four choices, this is not any different from chance. And so what this suggests to us, if we read but don't write a character, we may only learn those aspects of the shape that are crucial for distinguishing it from other characters in reading. Whereas if we're learning to write the character, we have to attend to all the major shape features uh, leading to, to better knowledge of the shape. Now, well, so what? We don't really think that adult readers have difficulty reading words with loop tail G, uh, but it may be that as children are learning to read, this form of G and also an unusual form of A could pose some difficulties for children. And this is worth looking into because if it does, that might have implications. If, it do, if these children don't have difficulty with this, it might call into question the recent suggestions that learning to write is important for, for learning to read. All right, now how we became instant internet celebrities, and I'll wrap up quickly. Uh, the Hopkins media people put out a news release on this, and it got picked up all over the web. It was discussed on social media, and so forth and so on. And one of the things they did was actually put out a little video on Twitter with the, this version of our experiment, and they asked people to to 
say what they thought was the correct answer, and this got like nearly 500,000 views in a few weeks. Uh, the social media discussions of all this clearly confirmed the results of our experiment that there was deficient knowledge of the shape. Even among those people willing to admit what they had chosen, a lot of them were wrong on this. But the discussions also suggested possibly a new phenomenon, which we would call <laughs> loop tail blindness, okay? Because some of the people claimed they had never even seen a loop tail G. And of course, this is highly implausible. Here I'm going to quote from an email that a man in Texas sent me. He said, I'm 76, graduated from high school in 1958. We were taught cursive after we learned to read and write print letters. Where did you find the four stylized genius in the test? And not only could I not pick the form you say is correct, I had never seen any of them. Okay. And he then went on to say, and I'm not making this up, that he was writing to ask me about it because all of his high school teachers were dead and he couldn't ask them. <laughs> all right, so running a little late, let me wrap up and just with one concluding remark which is in research on concepts, actions, and objects, which is why we're here. Writing is where the action is. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I have, oh, <laughs> I have a question about the second project that you um, presented. Actually, two questions. One is when you ask the patient, the patient to read what he wrote, does he find the error? Meaning, is there a dissociation? And the second, are the erroneous letters longer in duration from other letters? Because it seems like it might be an attention span problem, that he starts correct and then he, he just flies to another place with his attention. Okay, so first, this patient also has a quite severe letter identification deficit, uh, which pretty much expected from where his lesion is. Um, when he's asked to identify letters, he's about 70% correct. So if we show him his responses, he can often tell us that some of the letters are incorrect, but not always probably because of the letter identification deficit. Interestingly, he does not usually seem to be aware of the errors as he's making them. Uh, even, I mean, if he's really, really struggling to write a letter, occasionally he would take like 20 or 25 seconds to write a letter, then yes. But if we would ask him, you know, how do you think you've done, he would, he would think he was doing perfectly okay. Yeah, so, I'm still, you know, not totally confident of how to interpret all this, right? That sort of is more consistent with just something kind of automatically going wrong than something, is he's getting the wrong letter rather than something going wrong while he's writing a particular letter and then suddenly not knowing what to do. You would think he might then be very aware of there being a problem and trying to address it, but he doesn't particularly seem to be. So whatever he's doing once he has some problem writing, it doesn't seem to be a highly reflective thing where he's thinking, oh, look, I see these marks on the page. How could I make them into a letter? Okay, well, even though I think that at some level is what he's doing. Uh, with respect to your second question, so yes, I, as, I, as I showed you, he takes a lot longer to write incorrect letters usually than the correct letters. And that typically, involves starting okay, although not always, sometimes he has trouble from the beginning, and then having some problem partway through. And were you then asking whether maybe he is just having an attentional lapse of some kind? I don't think so, because he, he's, it's not that he gives any signs of not being, you know, attentive. He is working on it, and often, if you look, uh, I just showed you responses without any <laughs> movements of the pen not in the air. Sometimes you will see the pen moving back and forth. He'll put it here, then there. He's really, tr it looks like he is trying to, to write something. And then it's just not, it's not coming out right. And then he eventually will produce something. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's about all I think. 
Thanks. Hi. Um, so, uh, somewhat related uh, to what uh, Meital asked, uh, uh, I'm interested in the visual feedback that might be uh, involved here. Mm -hmm. um, so, for uh, the second uh, study, um, uh, did you try to block the vision? I mean, to block the uh, the feedback, because it seems that from the example that you showed, that once the error was made, then he tried to kind of make sense of what he did and maybe converted it to uh, some other uh, uh, letter representation. And the other thing that is related more to the first study is um, the relation between reading and writing skills. So if you take a subject that writes with strokes from left to right, uh, can he read the same, uh, the same efficiency, uh, the handwriting of people that are writing on the other way around? So they have uh, some connection in their presentations. Okay, so I'll see if I can remember your second question by the time I answer the first one. Uh, we did actually look at NGN's writing when he wrote with his eyes closed. He makes the same sorts of errors there. So I don't know that he's so much relying on visual feedback, but he clearly is monitoring in some way what he's writing. Okay. One other indication we have that he monitors what he's writing is that if he Let's say he's writing a word like elbow, where the first letter should be E, the second letter should be L. If he made a mistake and wrote an L in place of the E, he would then, in situations like that, typically really struggle with the second letter because he would know it shouldn't be the same as what he just wrote. Okay, And he almost inevitably made the wrong decision and decided that, or performed as if, the first thing he wrote was correct, and then the, the second one shouldn't be the same. So he clearly is monitoring what he's doing, and the, the fact that uh, he does the same thing with his eyes closed suggests that the visual feedback is not necessary for that. Okay. Yeah. Incidentally, he also makes the same errors whether he's writing with left or right hand, which is another reason for thinking this is at a level of some effect or independent uh, problems. Writing, uh, the reading and writing question about uh, whether you're looking at script written the same way you write or not, that's really interesting. There is a lot of evidence, and of course, even if you are looking at the static product of writing, that it carries information about the stroke pattern. So where it, there are little marks you tend to make at the end of a stroke when you're lifting the pen that are different from those you make at the beginning. And uh, people like Jennifer Fry have shown that that sort of information about the writing process plays a role in your, your interpreting. So whether, I mean, the number of questions you could ask here, if you say have somebody who writes with unusual stroke patterns, does that tend to make their writing less legible, independent of <laughs> some other measure of legibility you have? I don't know. And whether, say, a left-hander reading a right-hander's writing would have more difficulty. It's a really interesting question. I guess I just want to continue with this left-hander versus right-hander writing because it's a, sort of a really interesting question to me. My daughter is left-handed and so she's now learning to write and I'm observing how she's doing everything backwards. And in Australia where she first started to write, they don't seem to be as prescriptive with you know how you make your strokes. Whereas here in Italy, we've been here for three months and she's kind of being taught how to write properly, which is very against what she wants to do. So my question is, should, people, should teachers have different ways of teaching left-handers versus right-handers? Or should we actually leave it up to them to develop the most efficient way of, of doing the script? And is a, a more systematic way of teaching writing, in fact, going to disadvantage those kids even more because it is forcing them into stroke patterns that don't come naturally and comfortably and efficiently to them. Um, yeah, I, I don't pretend to you know, be an expert on the 
what the educator should do. But I think it is, it is worth considering that what makes for good, well-controlled writing is different for left-handers than right-handers, and that may be worth taking into account from the very beginning. It's quite clear that the left-handers are being taught to do things that are unnatural and you know, unpreferred because they all switch from doing that when they are actually on their own. Uh, with respect to you know, whether the schools are prescriptive or not, at least in the US, this kind of swings back and forth, right, from being very prescriptive about spelling and writing to, you know, we should not stifle the child's creativity, let them spell however they want, let them write however they want. I don't pretend to know what the right thing to do about that is either. Thank you, that was a very interesting talk. Um, I'm wondering about, um, well, two things. Uh, the first is uh, children and handwriting. Uh, where I live uh, in Ontario, um, they hardly teach handwriting anymore in elementary schools. Um, they do it in a half-hearted fashion for a couple of years, and then they basically just have all the kids switch to keyboards, which I imagine well, obviously changes the way, or there's going to be a change in how letters are represented in brains, more like the loop tail G, I, I, I suppose. Do you have any thoughts about yeah, that? Well, there, yeah, there are a number of people who've been arguing lately, like Karen James and Rika Longcamp, that learning to write is important for learning to read. Uh, for various possible reasons. One is that you get better learning of the character shape. Another is that there are some thoughts that when you have those motor programs that when you're reading the motor areas actually get activated and that may contribute to activation in the reading system and so forth. So I have to say at present the evidence for this is not spectacularly strong and I would say that at least in my opinion it's still a very open question. This is one reason why it might be interesting to look at whether kids have trouble with this loop tail G. If they they should, according to this this theoretical perspective. So I think. Yeah, I don't know. I, I want to keep an open mind about this. I don't want to, you know, say yes. We absolutely should teach children to write in cursive or you know, whatever it may be. Right. But clearly things are changing culturally Rapidly. such that we're doing a lot less, you know, writing by hand. The other very quick question I had is um, about the instructions that your participants were given because you, you can write prioritizing different aspects of writing. You can write for speed, you know, I, I write very messy if it's just for me, I write more legibly if it's for other people. And were your participants instructed in any explicit way to optimize speed or legibility or? That's, that's a good question. In our initial experiments, no they weren't. They were, they were told not to connect the characters, and they were told you know, to make it so we could read it. We're actually doing an experiment right now in which we're manipulating that. So uh, every, it's a within subject design where in different blocks they're told, I want you to write in your neatest, most legible handwriting, take your time, and then the others, I want you to write quickly. Uh, it still should be reasonably legible, but you know, write more like you, you ordinarily would and we are wanting to see whether we will see different constraint rankings for that. So we're still collecting the data. Thanks. I have a question about your modeling approach um, and alternatives that one might have considered or you might have considered. Uh, and as a, a bit of context, my question is maybe motivated by a debate that played out in the decision-making work on whether to build decision-making models where you have tons of parameters with weights that are composed, you know, combined in different ways versus um, fast and frugal decision trees. Uh, and the, the thing about fast and frugal decision trees is that there's a more of a structure to them that connects the different elements to each other. Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, so that there's contingencies between them, right? So if you go this path down the tree, then this. And the, the way I understand your model is it doesn't capture any relations among the different uh, criteria that people could be using. They're just, they, they're given weights that have priorities, but there's no contingency of if you head down this path, then something else now gets a higher weight. 
And I'm just wondering whether that kind of, again, inspired from the success of these fast and frugal um, decision tree models on, for example, medical decision making, whether or not you might be able to get a more structured model of your various constraints that actually does uh, better with fewer, uh, fewer constraints having to be built into the model. Sorry about speaking. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. And the more general question is, what's the best framework to use in doing this? One of the reasons we chose optimality theory is it is very constrained, no pun intended. The, the strict domination means that you know, weaker constraints can't gang up and overpower a high rank constraint. So in some sense, it's very restricted. So we could stay within that and loosen that so that we just we have weights on constraints. This would be more in linguistics terms, the harmonic grammar framework. And so this is one way we may go. And partly it's driven by how far can we get with this approach, right? But as you're saying, there are other approaches one could consider that would be sparser or simpler in other ways, perhaps with fewer constraints. And so this is just where we've started, and I think that's a fascinating set of questions that you know we want to explore, but haven't you know, haven't gone that far with. I'd be very interested to talk with you if you have some specific suggestions about about ways that we might go. You know what what we're finding is that we do very well with the prescribed stroke patterns. With the actual stroke patterns, there are some participants that we're not able to model at this point, and there are several possibilities. You know, one is this framework is just the wrong way to go. Another is we don't have quite the right constraints formulated quite correctly. Another one related to, to this question that, that was asked earlier, which is that it may be that when we put people in an experiment, they start out, they're trying to be nice and cooperative and you know, write nicely, but then by the time they've written you know, 80 words, they're getting really tired and they don't want to get out of there and are writing differently. So they're actually, the constraint parameters are actually different by the time they get to the end, which is one reason we're doing this experiment. We're trying to control how they're writing. So I think what we're trying to do is carefully evaluate why we're failing or we're failing and then trying to make decisions about how to go, go from there. I think in, in too much of modeling work, it's just basically, well, you know, we got 83.7% and, you know, the, the best framework otherwise gets 79.2%, so we're best. Uh, rather, we want to understand in a principled way what is working and what's not working. And if we definitely can get to a point saying that we think there are some in principle limitations in this approach that we're not going to be able to overcome, then we will be able to solve Another dimension to the problem, though, is that we're assuming that what we're dealing with is a set of stroke patterns that have been learned in a strictly rule-governed way, right? So let me back up just a second here. One of the questions is, at what point do these constraints come into play? We don't really think that online, every time you write an A, you are generating a stroke pattern by applying constraints. Rather, we're more inclined to think that these are constraints that are operative at the time you are learning to write, or perhaps then when you're developing your own writing style afterwards, and then those, those stroke patterns are more or less fixed, and you use them afterwards. So, we're assuming for simplicity that while you're learning each of your stroke patterns, your constraint rankings are constant, so that the way you write an R is going to be based on the same constraint ranking as the way you write a G, and that could turn out to be wrong, too. So that, but unfortunately, a lot of these different possibilities end up decreasing the constraint on, on the theorizing, so that We'll give, we will be giving ourselves more degrees of freedom, and I want to avoid doing that as much as possible until you know, it, it becomes absolutely necessary. Okay, just a, a quick question. Um, I missed that. What individuals did you analyze when you looked at these um, actual movement patterns in writing in the Hebrew? Preschool children or school children? No, they're adults. So 
these, all of these studies that we've done so far on adults, the, uh, the Hebrew speakers, the majority of them were tested in Israel, and some of them were uh, in the U.S., people who had initially learned, who initially had their school in Israel. But, but then how can you be sure that you've learned anything about your initial questions of how humans actually select a specific movement pattern out of different patterns, instead of just modeling how a group of people came up with a way how to teach a specific writing mm -hmm. style? Well, when we're modeling the prescribed patterns, what we are modeling is what educators came up with. And it could have been that that was largely unsystematic or based on some folk theory that <laughs> wouldn't, you know, wouldn't conform to any set of constraints like this. And when we are modeling actual writing, there certainly is an influence, there is bound to be an influence of the way you were taught to write. So if you were taught in some arbitrary, if, if the writing you were taught was in some sense arbitrary, that would surely have some residual effect on the way you actually write. Uh, what we're seeing is that the, we don't see that for the prescribed writing we need bizarre constraints. Uh, they, they're constraints that are reasonable in terms of the sorts of considerations I was talking about. What movements are well controlled, what gets you efficiently from one end of the character to the other, and so forth. So it turns out that I think there is some systematicity there. There are departures when people are actually developing their own writing style, but there's also <laughs> seem to be systematic in terms of emphasizing speed a little bit more. So what we, what we claim to be studying is the patterns that have been learned through this combination of education and personal choice later on. You could say maybe this is not the best domain to study. We could have gone back to just how people choose to draw shapes, and maybe that would be less contaminated by, by teaching, but we were particularly interested in, in writing. And yeah, you know, we can see the, the sorts of constraints we're using tend to be pretty similar to those that people discuss in the, in the topic. In Germany, in the same language, but very different constraints. Different ways of yes. writing. Yeah, well, I think that would be interesting, too. I've looked a little bit at some writing by, by French adults, and there are some different stroke patterns there, too. Uh, that would be an interesting part of the model. Any I'm under a very strict constraint to ask a quick question, and also the last <laughs> question is supposed to be funny, and it's unfortunately not a funny question. <laughs> uh, but I, I was it's sort of related to Sharon's question. Um, how much variance to explain with the set of constraints that you prescribed? Because they, they seem very physical in ways, the direction you move, or how you start. And it seems like there's a lot of cognitive constraints that come into play, contextual effects, uh, priming effects, and, and so on. So I'm wondering, can you? Are you able to identify by explaining away a lot of the variance based on these constraints, what are some maybe more data-driven cognitive constraints that influence writing that people previously didn't identify? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure the entire range you're talking about, but one thing we could ask about is, are there contextual effects, like is it the first letter in the word, or what letter came before it? We've seen, we don't see in looking at our actual writing data a lot of contextual effects like that. Like you might imagine if the previous letter ends at the bottom, you might start the next letter differently than if it ends at the top. It hasn't jumped out at us anyway, and we actually included a few manipulations like that. Did you have other kinds of cognitive constraints in mind? I'll talk with you offline. Yeah, okay, yes. great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the last question. Uh, uh, <laughs> I've been very patient. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm a sort of, it's, it's a, an anecdote and, and, uh, and a study. You, you, I'm sure you're familiar with the study Brenda Rapp and I did many years ago now, 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, where we found that uh, looking at the errors, reading errors, subjects of making letters, that we uh, could ac account for the variance, the patterns of errors they were making by looking at the stroke patterns that they used. Writing yes. 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 So that, that the stroke patterns were were involved, uh, um, uh, and not just the visual similarity of these errors. And uh, uh, the other uh, the anecdote, and then I can ask my question, is that 
I have a very bad handwriting. Um, and uh, you would think that because I am the producer of that handwriting that I would be the best person for reading what I wrote. But uh, you know Kathy Yantis, um, she could read my handwriting and I couldn't. So if I wrote something and I put it aside and I went back to, that, to that, what I'd written, I couldn't figure out what I'd written. And so there's the evidence where knowledge of the motor patterns doesn't seem to affect recognition. However, I believe you in your claim about, uh, uh, so what are the implications of that though? You didn't tell us. What does it mean then for a representation to be uh, involved in visual recognition uh, and at the same time have to appeal to a motor theory? And it, it seems, it sounds a bit like uh, Viviani's notion of a motor theory of perception. Is this what you're advocating? Yeah, so uh, with, your, with your study of the the errors involving stroke patterns. And this is just a nice example of how error analysis is very useful in, in determining what level of representation is affected. And it's also true for NGN that his substitution errors are better accounted for by stroke similarity than by visual similarity. With respect to the role of the motor knowledge in, in, in reading, yeah, perhaps Kathy Annis had better knowledge of your motor patterns than you do. I don't know. Uh, I won't speculate as to why that, why that might be the case. I also don't know. Uh, uh, all of this, of course, raises questions, and there's a lot of discussion about the role of motor knowledge in reading and learning to read and so forth. But I don't think that anything I've talked about leads to any clear conclusions about that. And I would consider those questions to be, to be open. Thank you, thank you, Mike. Uh, we, are, we are a bit late because we forgot to put in the 15 minute introduction in, our, in the program. Uh, so we'll try and, and uh, if, if people can come back uh, in, in 25 minutes, maximum 25 minutes, please, so that we then get 10 minutes uh, of the lunch, right? Please come back uh, at, uh, at, at 5 2. 11.15, so how much do we have? 25 minutes. How much? Oh, okay. 11.15 11 then. Okay, thank you. Jeez, I'm so confused. <laughs>